You are listening to Book Clips, a mini podcast in which authors or narrators do readings from novels. Check out the show notes for the synopsis and buy links for this book. Deadly Deception, Riley Hayes Thriller Book 2, written by Kate Brogan, narrated by Emily Beresford. Prologue, five years ago. Addison labored into her cumbersome suit. Equipped with tubing and a respirator, she wore the work attire of a virus hunter. She was in West Africa, exploring remote caves, searching for the next great deadly pathogen, hoping to discover the next great miracle cure. Be ready in a minute. Take your time, her business partner responded. Gordon was a handsome man in his late forties, tall, dark, and strong, a man from whom she'd hoped for more than a business partnership. Two dates and one decade later, she'd resolved to settle for co-ownership of a struggling biotech company, New Day Pharmaceuticals. Traveling the world, working by his side to outsmart pathogens, at this place in her life, it was good enough. Did you check your batteries? I forgot, but I will now, Addison responded, checking the dial. Two-thirds charge, Maybe we should go back so you can top it off. We won't be down that long, Addison countered, turning to have him check her seals, knowing that they made the difference between health and exposure. Gordon stepped onto the second rung of the dangling wooden ladder, his head shaking slowly. Addison smiled, allowing her gaze to linger for a moment. What can I say? I'm a risk taker. Yeah, and it's gonna get you in trouble someday, Gordon responded the last sliver of daylight vanishing with his next step downward. Not if I can help it, she responded, sweeping her net through the dark to catch their first specimen, a long-fingered vesper. Chapter One Cold-hearted bitch killed him, Riley said, looking up. She killed her parents, I tell ya. She got them to cash in their savings, turn over the proceeds from the sale of their home, and she killed them. Her eyes narrowed, rubbing the back of her neck. Why am I the only one who can see it? It's as clear as day, I tell ya. See what? The newly hired detective asked, removing her sunglasses and joining the conversation. She was a clean-cut biracial woman, 28 years old, wearing pleated trousers and a blue Oxford. She had her hair trimmed neatly into a boy cut. That your new partner's stuck in a loop. Same loop she's been in for months, Rich said, collecting Joanna Gray's file from Riley's hand. Hayes has it in her head that this doer is still alive, alive and racking up victims, even when a mountain of evidence says differently. Here, see what you think. I read about this case, Claire said, opening the file jacket. Showed up on the front page of our local paper. I'm not surprised, Riley said. It made national attention, stayed there for weeks. That and the doer, Joanna Gray, came from around your area. Funny how things work out, Claire said. When I read that article, I never dreamed I'd be moving here. Found her car at the bottom of the Illinois River, if I remember right. With a big old blood-stained piece of the doer's shirt snagged on the driver's window, Rich said. Glass probably shattered when the car hit bottom. Or maybe Gray smashed it trying to get out. Blood doesn't mean she's dead. Riley countered. For all we know, the bitch left it for us. Left it so we'd think the crash killed her. See what I mean? Rich said. Stuck in a loop. Probably would be too if the doer tried to kill my wife and me and I thought she might try again. He extended his hand. Don't think we've been formally introduced, he said. Rich Winters, on the clock for two more hours. Pleasure, Claire responded, shaking it firmly. You were off the day I interviewed. Burning some benefit time, Rich said, unbothered by the fact she'd interviewed for his position. Glad you stopped by before I got out of here. I'm sure Hayes and I will be talking about you from time to time. And glad I'll have a face to put with your name. You have big plans? Claire asked. For retirement, I mean. Camping, Rich answered. Hardly been for ages and plan to make up for it. He slid his palm over his head. Might just go from one campground to another. Never return to pavement and skyscrapers. That's what he says now, Riley interjected. But he'll tire of it. Just wait and see. Don't think so, Rich said, turning her way. You love Chi-Town and this job way more than I do. 
you'll be back, Riley said. You'll be back begging for reinstatement before this season comes to an end. You'll be back, you'll see. You'll be back because being a cop's in your blood, just like me. Guess we'll see, won't we? Rich said, dropping into his seat. Well, I should be going, Claire said, returning the file to Riley. See you in the morning. With next to no experience as a homicide detective, and all of what she did have from working in a highfalutin Boston suburb, she'd be lucky if she could do the job. Yeah, Riley said, in the morning. Friendly enough, Rich commented, watching the muscular woman banter her way through and out of the bullpen. And folks seem to like her. I suppose, Riley said, but being likable doesn't mean she's right for the job. No, Rich said, but it doesn't mean she's not. The room smelled of coffee, yeast, and cigarettes that next morning, as it did on any other morning. I brought bagels, Claire announced, taking a second to take in her new partner as she stepped into their pod. And strawberry cream cheese, low fat, she added, taking a sip of latte. That's nice. Riley said, looking up for a fraction of an instant, but we usually pick up day old from the donut shop. She was a masculine woman, lean and fit, with olive colored skin. Her deep brown hair was feathered above her eyebrows. So I gathered, Claire responded, having noticed the open box, complete with dried out samples. I just thought I'd do something a little different. She tilted her head. You know, doing my part to break the cop stereotype. Riley nodded. Yeah, well, I guess if the guys don't like them, you can take them home with you tonight. Yeah, I guess I can, Claire answered, stepping around to look over her shoulder. The bullpen was set up so that partners faced one another. So what are you working on? What I always work on first thing, Riley answered, the gray case. One of these days, I'm gonna catch the bitch. Her breath blew across the pages of her file. <sighs> She's gonna slip up, and when she does, I'm gonna be there to slap on cuffs. Fresh pair of eyes? Claire offered, holding her hand out, palm up. Yeah, sure, Riley responded, handing her the file. Need a fill up? She asked, tipping her mug for the last drop. No, I'm good, Claire answered. Too much caffeine makes me jumpy. Helps me focus, Riley responded, stepping off. When she returned, she emptied three packets of sugar into steaming black coffee. Claire cocked her head. Spot peppers? Yeah, Riley responded, smiling as she looked at the graphic on her mug. My stepdaughter, well, my almost stepdaughter, her school sells them as a fundraiser. She's in the marching band, a drummer. High school? No, middle, Riley said, reaching into her back pocket and opening her wallet. This is Abby. She pointed to the image of a clean-cut, biracial adolescent, sporting a boy cut. She marched in the Macy's parade this year. Her brown eyes took on a sparkle. Did a pretty good job, if I might say so myself. I'll bet she did. Claire responded, studying the adjacent photograph. And this one? Is that you and your fiancé? Yeah, that's us, Riley said, smiling, taken last summer at our engagement party. She's a pretty woman, Claire commented. Good-looking family. Thanks, Riley responded. How about you? You have anyone? No, Claire said, pausing for a long drink of latte. Just me and my little dog. She released a breath when the phone rang, sending them out on what could be a triple homicide. Chapter Two So what do you think? Riley asked, dropping in on the passenger side. Think? About Gray, I mean. You think she is dead or alive? Alive, Claire responded, zipping through a parking lot and across four lanes of traffic with lights but no siren. Riley lifted an eyebrow, checking her seatbelt as they jockeyed between two cars. She's too conniving to be dead, Claire went on, glancing over and back to the road. Good grief, we had her dead to rights. She shook her head, her upper lip curling slightly. No, a woman like that? She doesn't manage to kill an officer, slip away unnoticed, and then just happen to die in a car crash on her way out of town. No, she's not dead. She's very much alive. Yep, my sentiments exactly, Riley responded. And I can't help but think she's coming back. Maybe already has. You know, to try to finish what she started. Claire nodded, darting between a semi and a garbage truck, not caring that the semi driver laid on his horn. She's cocky enough to try, that's for sure. 
cocky bitch will probably get right back under our nose, thinking we're not going to catch her. But we will. You just watch. Before you know it, we're going to be slapping on the cuffs. She smiled, looking over. And I didn't just say that to make you like me. I like you already. No, you don't. Yes, I do, Riley responded. It's just that Rich and I, well, we worked together for a long time. I know you did, Claire responded, exiting the expressway, going 20 over the speed limit. And I respect that. I respect it, but he's on his way to Georgia. And you and me, well, we're partners now. And I think it'll work a whole lot better if you try to like me, at least a little. Riley cocked her head, her chin tucked down. I don't dislike you, Robbins. Maybe not, Claire responded. But you don't like me. You don't think I've got what it takes to do the job. But I do. She stopped when the light turned red, changing the subject. So, the hospital we're going to, wasn't it the one that was built in the mid-1800s? Her eyes narrowed. The one that used to be the county insane asylum? What are you, a trivia champ or something? No, Claire said, shrugging her shoulders. I just read, that's all. When the light turned green, she moved forward, and the white economy sedan followed her around the corner. Uh, it turns up ahead, right? Claire asked, turning on her signal. Yep, Riley said, on Oak Park. She smiled slightly. For just moving here, you know your way around pretty well. Studied the map, studied it until I knew it backward and forward. Riley nodded, guilt slicing through the bottom of her stomach like a sharp knife through warm butter as the psychiatric facility came into view. It was a familiar pain, one that she'd endured since elementary school, since her mom's first hospitalization there. She should have visited more often, should have kept better track of her through the years. She couldn't help it that she was mentally ill. But seeing her, seeing the crazy in her eyes, it made it too real. Can't wait to hear what took them so long to call us. Yeah, you and me both, Riley answered. Must have seen something on the autopsy. That's all I can figure. I tried to get him to go into specifics on the phone, but he wouldn't. He just kept saying he wanted to talk in person. As she prepared herself to work a case involving poison, her thoughts swept back to the previous summer, to Joanna Gray's face, her eyes bulging from their sockets, to the burn of the poison slithering through her veins, robbing her lungs of oxygen, to Kenzie sobbing as she cradled her in her arms. Hayes? Hayes, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Her eyes widened, coming up on the grounds. What the hell? What the hell is right? Claire mumbled. Don't think I've ever seen that many wearing hazmats in one location, except maybe in an apocalyptic thriller. So much bright yellow made the scene seem like a movie set, almost surreal. Gotta be something contagious. But if it is, then it's not a homicide. And if it's not a homicide, then why'd they call us? Guess we'll know soon enough. Guess we will. ID, please. Yeah, right here, Riley responded, displaying her badge. Detective Hayes. She nodded toward Claire. And my partner, Detective Robbins. Staging areas over there, the suited man said, directing them toward a biohazard bubble erected some distance from the main door. Dr. Walter Matthews, Riley continued. He's expecting us. It'll be a while, he responded. Been a busy morning, you know. How about you go on over and take a seat? If you go in, you'll have to suit up, and that's where you'll do it. I'll call him. Let him know you're here. Thanks. Appreciate it. Not sure I like the idea of going somewhere I have to suit up. Claire commented, falling one step behind her. Not thrilled about catching some virus either. Suits are airtight, Riley assured, looking over her shoulder. Got nothing to worry about. Yeah, right. I've read articles. It only takes a hole the size of a pinprick for you to catch something. Stay back if you want. I'm not staying back. Riley smiled. Okay, so you're just whining. Yes, mod ass. I'm just whining. The sun was at its highest point in the sky when the CDC's man in charge stepped inside the protective enclosure. Sorry to keep you waiting, he greeted. Not a problem, Riley responded. Good to see you again. They'd first come to know one another back when he'd worked at the CDC's quarantine station, and she'd walked a beat on the shores of Lake Michigan. What was it, ten years now? She nodded toward Claire. My new partner, Detective Robbins. Oh, that's right the small-boned man responded. Winter's retired. 
He had a bald spot on the top of his head, wore glasses, and had bright blue eyes. He exchanged pleasantries with Claire, noticed her Boston accent, and asked about Rich's retirement plans. He headed off that next morning for Pine Mountain, Georgia, Riley answered. Plans to keep moving for a while. I know you'll miss him. Riley pursed her lips, nodding slowly. Yeah, I will. Played golf in Pine Mountain once, he continued nostalgically. Callaway Gardens, beautiful course. Riley chuckled softly. <laughs> Don't think he'll be playing golf. No, I'd say not. If I had to guess, he has a campsite at the F.D. Roosevelt State Park. Yep, plans to do some geocaching. His new hobby. Good for him, he said, his eyes taking on a sparkle. Two more years and I might just do some myself. Riley made a face, her voice lifting in exaggerated disappointment. Now you're retiring? I'll have my 30 years in, he responded. And the older I get, the more I realize that there's more to life than work, especially when there's next to no recognition of the sacrifices you make for it. He had the look of a man who on this day felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. Riley pushed dread out of her mind, knowing that one day Ken's would want her to turn in her badge, leave law enforcement. If, when, that day came, what in the world would she do with herself? She took a breath fully expanding her lungs. So, what have we got? Initially, he began, it looked like a foodborne bacterium. Claire scribbled a note. Like salmonella or E. coli? Similar, he answered. Clostridium perfringens. It's a pathogen found in raw meat and poultry. And since all three had what appeared to be undercooked portions of meatloaf for dinner, the initial assumption was that it was the culprit. But after the first autopsy, Riley said, the M.E. realized it wasn't, and that's when they called us. Walt nodded. And us. So the virus is contagious, Claire said, her eyes narrowing. But you guys think the exposure was intentional? It was the only reason she could think of that they'd have notified both the CDC and her division. Extremely contagious, he responded. And yes, he continued with a breath, we believe the exposure to have been intentional, at least with regard to the first three victims. Claire lifted her pen. The first three victims? Yes, the patients, he responded. The subsequent four were mental health technicians. All but one expired between the time the M.E. called it in and your arrival. That quick? Riley asked, her mouth falling open. I thought patient Zero was just found this morning. She was he responded, shaking his head. Viral strains, they get stronger each year. Superbugs, Claire commented. Similar in that both are quite deadly, he responded. But superbugs are actually bacterial infections that have become resistant to antibiotics over time. But what we're dealing with here, he continued, is a viral infection. The distinction between the two is that antibiotics are effective against bacteria, but they're never effective against viruses. So developing a vaccine is the best option? Containing it and developing a vaccine are the only options, he responded. When a virus enters the body, it invades cells, taking over their replication machinery. Viruses need living hosts to multiply. Without them, they won't survive. He shook his head. It's beyond me why someone would intentionally release this monster on the population. He swallowed, looking off. The way it sweeps through the body. I've never seen anything like it, not in this country. He pinched the skin at his throat, his voice becoming deadly quiet. And we thought Ebola was bad with its 90% fatality rate. Dear God, help us. So if this thing spreads, Riley said, we're all dead meat. Is that what you're saying? There would most certainly be potential for an explosive outbreak, an outbreak that could make our fight to contain Ebola look like a walk in the park. So we're dead meat. An Ebola vaccine was found to be effective during a recent West African outbreak, he responded. And we're optimistic that. So there's hope, but while you work on a vaccine, the ones who get this virus are all dead meat. That is what you're saying. We have the building under quarantine, he said, and we're hoping to contain the outbreak. 
But it'll be an uphill battle as long as we've got the doer exposing people, Riley responded. Can you talk a bit more about the intentional piece? I can, he said, sliding a building diagram across the table and pointing to a patient room at the center of a second floor hallway. So, the first victim was found here. He moved his finger, pointing to a patient room at the center of a third floor hallway. And the second victim was found here. He moved it again, pointing to a patient room at the center of a fourth floor hallway. And the third victim was found here. He looked up. All expired during the night, in their beds, within minutes of one another. Riley's eyes narrowed. Without having any contact? She picked up the paper, studying the diagram. Without having any contact, he responded. Claire jotted notes, talking out loud. No contact, on different wings and on different floors. Riley released a breath, her brow furrowed. <sighs> and each victim sealed off from the others by airtight doors. She moved her finger along the sketched corridor. How about ventilation? Separate systems, he said, pointing to the diagram. Interesting. Riley responded, fingering back her hair. But not that surprising, Claire commented. Not with the size of the structure. No, not the number of systems, Riley responded. But if you're the doer, wouldn't it have been easier to do three in a row? Deadly Deception, Riley Hayes Thriller, Book Two. Written by Cade Brogan. Narrated by Emily Beresford. You have been listening to Book Clips. Check out the show notes for the synopsis and buy links for this book. If you are interested in showcasing your novel, then check out the show notes for more information.